Bashar, my man, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate you. For sure. Uh, and I'm excited about this one because I'm excited to learn. Make sure you guys got a pen and a piece of paper. So without further ado, man, let's just jump right in. Bashar, man, take me back to the beginning. How did this whole entrepreneurial journey start for you? It was a few things. First of all, it was my father was an entrepreneur back home in Iraq, which is where I'm originally from. And he, he set the path for the entire family to want to go into that route. Seeing his journey, he was a mover. He was a shaker. He was very respected in the family and the community mm -hmm. as well. And I wanted to, I, like, I wanted to always be like him. As I grew up throughout the years, especially after the war in Iraq in 2003, we had to flee Iraq because it was just really bad. He couldn't really live there. We came to America and the kind of the last decade of my dad's journey as an entrepreneur Actually, he kind of lost everything. And so my mom pretty much sold me on the idea that if you want to be successful in, in, in America, you want mm -hmm. to, to be a, you want to have a degree. You have to, you want to go to college. You want to do something in the, of that sense, because entrepreneurship is not guaranteed. You saw your dad, he got what he had businesses. He did very well for himself and then he lost everything. And so for a while there, I got into school and I wanted to go into school and I, I even had a. I got like a white coat that had Dr. Ketu on it yes. and all that. And so I lived the dream of wanting to become a doctor, go to school and all that. And after a couple of years of going to school, I just realized that it wasn't for me. Not that the education was bad, but it was just that I wasn't fit for that. It just wasn't a thing for me. I wanted something that was a little more fast paced. I wanted something that had challenges. I wanted something that's going to, that was going to put me, put my neck on the line every day when I was going to be against challenges and against walls. And that's the thing that drive me, drove me at the time. And so in, in 2011, it was our first entrepreneurial venture in America. We bought a, a local pizzeria and we ran it. It was me, my brother, and, and my mom and dad at the time, my mom was about 64 or 60. My dad was 72. They were helping us out. And then my brother and I ran the place seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Wow. That was How old were you back then? I was about 19, 20 years old. So that was the first time that I actually became an entrepreneur or mm. had my own business, at least a family business. But I had started working as a burger. I was flipping burgers at McDonald's at 16. That was my first job. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's how it all started. For sure. So, yeah. so from there, <clears throat> You are helping out with the family. Your mom's like, okay, you need to go to college, get a degree. That's how the most people are successful in this world to have something that's secure. Or you can see what happened with your dad, right? That entrepreneurship isn't certain and you don't want to make the mistake, the fear of failing. And so she trying to protect you get into the family business with the pizzeria. And so then what happens after that? About two years into it, I just realized that becoming being in a family business, it's good and it's bad. And I know some people have had that experience. Some people have had it, but it's a, it's a good, I guess the benefits of it are the fact that you have some type of a, like a backbone you have people that are supporting you, people that care about you, people that want to see you succeed. But then the problem with that is also is when you're getting in business with your family, things get a little, I don't know, things get a little icky sometimes and you can't really move the way that you want to move. At the time, my brother was in charge of the business. I was, again, 18, 19, 20 years old. I didn't have a whole lot of experience. He's eight, nine years older than me. And I wanted to go at 120 miles an hour. He wanted to go at 20 miles an hour. And we just would clash a lot. Mm. And we just wouldn't, we just wouldn't work together very well. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't where you do this, I do this. We just didn't have that kind of communication. And unfortunately, we just didn't have that in the family to begin with. My dad was always very busy at work. We, we only saw him at night. My mom was, she did the best she could. She did the best that she knew how to do. But we never had that like communication as family. We never had that, those sit downs. We never had those conversations where my dad would sit me down and talk about what it's going to look like now that you're a teenager, you're going to start dating or that kind of stuff. We just never had that. And so... Each one of us grew up on their own and learned from the streets and from whatever, movies and whatever else. And so that's why there just wasn't a bond and things just broke off. I finally decided that I was going to do something else. So I took my college fund and I invested in a business. Now was my first personal business. That was the business that I ran. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And that seems like that's a challenge right there because you're in a family business. 
There's the whole hierarchy of you the middle brother or the middle son. It depends on your say so and experience and then who who yeah. your parents see as the leader, and who actually is the leader, who really has the strengths and the weaknesses. All those things get blurred. And then that carries over into Thanksgiving dinner and at the dinner table and Christmas. And so that's really yeah. complicated. But I am curious on what lessons you learn from that that you were able to use in your business to either see the patterns of what not to do or to learn what to do as a leader with having a, a business that's doing 2 million cash per month collected. The definition of a leader is someone who can influence others to taking action or taking certain action. I didn't know that. And so for me, it was, this is what my mindset is. This is what I know to do. And I'm just going to do everything I can to make it happen. There was no give and take. There was no, let me use some type of psychology to not manipulate you, but more of see why my way is the right way, but also have the open-mindedness of I'm willing to take feedback. I was a young kid. I had a huge ego and whatever I thought was right. I thought it, that was like the Bible. This was like the law. This was the rule. I, it had to happen. He obviously learned that wasn't the way. So right now, the way that I make decisions in my company, we have a leadership team of five, six people. I don't make decisions by myself. Although I am the CEO, I am the founder, I own 100% of the business. I don't get to do my way all the time. There are many things where I still don't get my way and off, not often, but sometimes I've learned how to cope with it. But many times I'll walk out of meetings and I'm just like, Fuck, I didn't get what I wanted, but that's not because of the team. That's because of my communication skills, because I need to learn how to better influence people and better explain why my vision is the right way to do it. And many times, not sometimes, but many times, it's not the right way because right. I've been influenced by a specific thing. And to me, this is one way. But then when you go and when you allow, when you allow collaboration, you different point of views that you haven't, hadn't been exposed to before. And so it's very important that you're able to, number one, you learn how to influence people, but number two, be willing to take feedback and put yeah. your ego aside. 100%. And I think that for a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs, we want to have so much control over the business. And quite frankly, that can be the biggest constraint because a lot of times what happens is the fatigue sets in where you're trying to come up with all the new ideas, come up with all the new marketing, come up with all the new ad copy, all the new copywriting, come up with all the new standard procedures. And what happens is your team never has the ability to develop and take on that role of ownership in that thing that they have because they're always just waiting for you to make the decision. So I'm just curious for you, what specific things, because we're talking about making decisions collectively, what specific things have you had to collaborate with that it ended up working out well for you getting and sparking ideas from your team? I remember one time I, our marketing team just wasn't doing what I expected them to do. And so what I did was I, I came up with this strategy and I thought this was a brilliant strategy. So then what I did was I, I went to them and I said, Hey, I need you guys to make this happen. Now, granted our business was on the eight figures by now, and I alone did not get it there. My team helped get it there. 90% of the lift was my team. I might've just pushed a little bit. And I went there and I almost imposed, and this was the very first time that I imposed anything on my team. Right. And I said, I need this to happen. I don't care what you need to do. I need this to happen. And then what I realized about six months into it, maybe looking back, maybe they didn't put their 100% because it wasn't their idea. And that's the other thing as well, is that I imposed it on them. It didn't work out. And then what I realized is that, and instead of imposing an idea on your team, Instead, what do you want to do is you want to sell them on the idea. You want to make sure that they have buy-in into the idea. For example, are you married or do you yes. have a girlfriend? Yeah, okay. I'm married. Five okay, years. so yeah. that's awesome, man. Congratulations. Thank you. So if you, and I know it happens with me. I don't know what happens with you, but my wife will come to me and will say, hey, should I wear these shoes or those shoes? Yeah. She'll ask me and I'll give my honest opinion, but then she'll do the, the opposite, right? Because it's coming from me, it's not coming from her. So then I started using the complete, the, the kind of a- Reverse psychology, say, yeah. Pretty much. And what I would say is, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> well, she'll either do, she'll either, let's say yesterday we were going out and then I asked her and I said, hey, what do you think? 
And then she was like, oh, I don't know, maybe this is too much. I'm like, yeah, exactly. The other one is really cute. I think you'd look really good in those. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Where before I would almost impose my opinion on her and then she'll be like, no, I'll go with this other one. Just because it's a human nature, we don't want people to tell us what to do. Yeah. Tony Robbins says, if I say it, you don't believe it. If you say it, you believe it, right? Mm. So it's really important that whatever it is you're trying to communicate to the other person, you make it in a way of their best interest. You communicate it in a way of, this is why your future, not my future, your future, your opportunity is gonna move forward, right? It's not about me, it's about us, it's about the collective, and most importantly, it's about you, right? Yeah. When you put other people's interests first, you're able to move the needle a lot further than when you're coming from a place of me. Yeah, and I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. And the best quality of the best leaders is getting your team to uh, teaching them how to think, right? Because a lot of times what the team becomes dependent on you, but the best leaders teach their team how to think and they get them to think for themselves. So you ask, them, well, what do you think? And what happens is a lot of times when your team runs up against problems, instead of them running to you for it, they'll start to try to figure it out on themselves. And so when you start asking them, what do you think? Now they start solving their own problems. And I think for a lot of leaders, we kind of have this bottleneck in our business where a lot of times we start taking ownership over other people's problems and the jobs that they have. But a lot of times that strength in leadership is just people how to think and allow them to try to, to solve problems on their own. But yeah, that's pretty huge, man. So I'm glad you brought that point up. So start your first entrepreneur business. It was that when you got into coaching or was that pre coaching and consulting? Oh no, this was, this was about 12 years ago. So this was a long time ago, my coaching business. So in my career, I've launched nine businesses, seven of which have failed. And my coaching business is my ninth business. And so my coaching career is the most recent career that I've had. It's the most successful. I'm not going to lie, but it's also the most impactful. And this is why I think it's the most successful because all the other ones, all the other careers, it was self-centered. It was about me and my interest and what I can do to provide for me. But my coaching business and pretty much everyone, I don't want to say everyone, but most of the people in this industry will tell you, when you take time out of your day to show other people the way, yes. right? Oh, yes, you're not doing it for free. Yes, it's not for charity. You are making money. But when you take time to show other people how to improve their life, improve their finances, improve their bodies, improve their relationships, whatever else, their minds, it's a selfless type of job. Mm -hmm. And Tony Robbins talks a lot about, he talks about these two things, and that's the, um, the science of achievement and mm -hmm. art of fulfillment. of fulfillment. Yes. And so the science of achievement is what we mean you have figured out. It's how to make money. But he talks about how for one of his books, he interviewed 50 billionaires. And he said, at least from my experience, only about seven of those 50 billionaires were actually truly happy. Everyone mm. else was miserable. And he says there is a reason why a lot of like athletes, especially those that, that are in, I don't know what he called them, but that are in like single person sports, I guess you could say like yes. tennis player or a golfer or whatever, unlike say a basketball player or soccer player, football player, where it's a team thing, right. usually, or like an actor, usually drop off right after they, they accomplish the best thing or the mm. thing that they've been shooting for all of their lives because all of their lives they've been shooting for this thing that's only going to benefit them. Winning the golden medal or w winning an Oscar or whatever, it's only really going to benefit me. But we are only truly fulfilled when we actually give back to other people, when we actually do things for other people, I don't care who you are, you will drop everything in your life for a loved one. Yes. I like, sometimes I'll have a headache or I'll be sick or something like that. And I have work. I don't even care to go get checked. But if my wife complains from a headache or something happens to my wife or something happens to my dog, I will leave work and go take her to the hospital because we, humans are designed to find true joy and fulfillment when we actually care about other people. And so my journey as a coach really evolved and became a thing after I had make, after I had made money with my Amazon business and had pretty accomplished my goals, short-term goals, and realized that my life was pretty empty and that I, there, there, was, there was no drive anymore, but there was no desire to dream big or do more things. It's what's the point. 
And that's when I was helping out a couple of people and they got results. Right. And then I found fulfillment. And that's when it evolved into an actual business. And now I just, I just love it. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. And that's great. So you said a couple of things in there and I want to unpack this. And especially for that nine to five out there that's watching this and they hear something about you started nine businesses and seven of them failed. And I'm just curious to hear now looking back, because it probably didn't feel good along the way, what that feedback was from you and how you look at those seven businesses that weren't a success but they also still contributed to you having an eight, nearly nine figure business soon to be coming up. Like, how were you able to, what were the lessons that you learned from having those seven businesses? Everything I learned in business came from the failures, but there is, I don't know where I heard this. There's a quote that says, a smart man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from others' mistakes. And so I wouldn't be who I am today had I not gone through all of those failures. But the problem was, <laughs> It took me eight business, seven, seven failed businesses until I realized that there's got to be an easier way of doing this. Mm. There's got to be a, another way of needing to fail for me to learn from my failures because the first failure was miserable. The second one, third one, fourth one, I was like, I just got used to it. And then, then the last few businesses actually succeeded. Like the business actually took off and did very well for a short period of time and then fell off a cliff. Looking back at that, I was like, all right, there's got to be another way of learning from my mistakes because the first few businesses, it was terrible. And then I realized that there were so many lessons that I was learning that I was evolving that the next business, I did it better the next business, I did it better. And I was like, but how many businesses is it going to take for me to finally actually succeed and succeed for long periods of time? And so that's when I learned about coaching and mentors and learning from other people's. And this is when I realized that I probably would have found success in those other businesses had I tapped into other people's success, other people's kind of roadmap, you know, mm. had I not just gone ahead and done it myself. So gotcha. I think there is a balance there between, yes, you do want to jump in and figure it out, but also you could probably avoid or minimize your mistakes if you tap into other people's mistakes. Yeah, 100%. And so it sounds, again, you said you were driven me, 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 which also means you, you had to learn all the lessons all by yourself. And that's a lot, that's very painful and time consuming. And so over that period of time, I don't know, said you said 12 years. So that's a lot of pain and agony. I mean, you know how it is, the business goes up and down and the power of coaching and mentorship can literally compress time and save you a lot of heartache. And so that's what I want to transition into now. So when you figured it out, when was that? And then obviously it was from you doing it yourself, but when did you start to see results in your clients that was like, okay, I've got something and now I got to try to share this with everybody. First of all, after having seven failed businesses, you would think that one would have learned, but I obviously didn't. <laughs> so I went and I gave a shot to online business for the first time in 2015, I think it was 2016. And, and that's when I tried multiple things. And that's where I tell people about this thing of discovery phase. I think everyone needs to be in a discovery phase. So if you're in a nine to five trying to transition into having your own business or having, that, that's the other thing is you don't necessarily need to start your own business to be successful in life, but be in an industry or in a career where you have control over your outcome, right? Mm. More input results in more output because you could work. We have many people in our company that are in the six figures. We have a few people in our company will do well in the seven figures this year. Now you might look at them and say, yeah, but they work for someone else, but do they? The more they put in equals more they get out. And it's not necessarily time. And that's the other thing that people don't understand is that you don't necessarily need to have your own time invested for you to put in more because sometimes people say, yeah, okay, if I put in more, I get out more. Okay, I get it. But then it's, I've got a family, I've got, a, I've got kids, I've got this, I've got that. How many hours am I going to work a day? This is why I say you need to have more control because I have people in our company where they've hired their own VAs. They pay a VA two, three, five hundred dollars and they can produce double the outcome. So now they've doubled their income and then they can literally build their own teams. But because we also allow them to, mm. we allow them to create like a business within the business where other companies are a little more rigid. I'm hiring you to do X, Y, and Z. I expect you to do X, Y, and Z. And for someone out there that's listening who owns a business, it's important that you lead based on outcome. Be obsessed with the outcome. Mm. I don't give a shit what you do as long as the outcome is there. Now, there are parameters that I want you to follow. There is a box that I want you to operate within 
but you also want to have some flexibility. Now, these glasses, they are flexible. They don't right. give me a headache. They, they can go back and forth and stuff like that. So that's what you want to do. This provides stability, but then they're also flexible. So if I need to expand them a little bit, if I've got a bigger head than the average person, which I do, they also will fit. So that's the other thing that leaders out there need to understand. And if you are trying to transition into a nine to five and, and your current career does not allow for that, I always suggest people to go into this thing called the discovery phase. Yeah. And for me, discovery phase is finding three to five things that you personally are interested in, follow them or research them for whatever long it is, three to six months at least, I would say. And then after that period, find one of those things that you're going to go into 100% uh -huh. and ask yourself these two questions. Number one, do I see myself committing the next one to two years for this one thing without getting distracted by anything else? No crypto, no investments. If the answer is yes, ask yourself the second question. If after one to two years, this thing completely flops, it goes nowhere. Will I regret the last one to two years? If the answer is no, then go for it. If the answer is yes, then that's not the right one. Because do understand, after 12 years, I launched seven businesses which failed, mm -hmm. right? If I regretted every single business, I would literally probably have dug myself a grave somewhere and just said, screw this, it's not worth it. But it was, I learned, I evolved, going on to the next thing. I learned, I evolved, I went on to the next thing. And so it's really important that you go through that uh, discovery phase and figure out what it is that you want to go into. For sure. And yeah, that's what I kind of want to transition into to what you're actually helping people with. We got two types of people. We got the the nine to fivers and then we got the entrepreneurs, people who have started something and they got these same feelings, right? They either stuck at a dead end job and they're like, okay, recession's coming. They're not sure of their future and they're starting to look like, okay, maybe I need to try to figure out a, a plan B, a side hustle, a contingency plan. And then you got the entrepreneur where it's like, okay, I'm doing this coaching, consulting, digital marketing agency, but I'm responsible for other people's businesses or all the results. And I don't want to have that much responsibility. So I'm just curious on what it is exactly what you're coaching that you're offering people that can help them. So first of all, you got to figure out, am I an entrepreneur or am I an entrepreneur? So an entrepreneur is someone who is willing to take greater than normal risks to accomplish a certain goal. An entrepreneur is as qualified, but they would rather get on someone else's shoulder. They would rather have someone like me or you have built a foundation and pretty much go in and tap into that, right? So many people in our company are entrepreneurs. I know several of them are also entrepreneurs and there might be a time and if I don't create them enough opportunity, there might be a time where they will just fall off to go do their own thing. Will they be successful? I don't know, but it just, it needs to be their own thing. They need to be in total control. Entrepreneurs don't need to necessarily be in total control as long as they have some control. And as a business owner, you need to understand that and you need to see that and give them that control. Obviously, again, to operate within that box. So as far as let's address the two different buckets. So if you are a nine to five or trying to go into something else, the recession is coming in. You know, what I would do is, again, I would go into that discovery phase. That would be my advice for you is go into that discovery phase, figure out this one thing that you want to go into. And then put a timeline because that's the other thing that people don't do is I'm going to start a side hustle. Okay, great. I want to make more money. Okay, right. here's another dollar. <laughs> is, does that satisfy that? You want to be clear and specific and add a timeline. I want to make an extra $50,000. That's more specific. But then when you add a timeline, it creates urgency. I want to make an additional $50,000 by the end of the year. Okay, right. it's very specific. And that has a time frame which is urgent now. It creates urgency. And when people feel urgent, they have pressure and they actually take action. If you just make, oh, I want to make $50,000. All right, I'm 30 years old. I'm going to die hopefully by 90. So I've got another 60 years to make $50,000. I'll probably going to do that. So I have all the time to do. I'm not going to worry about it today, tomorrow, next year. So that's the first thing that I would do for a nine to five. And then you have to decide. Do I want to transition into that full time or is this kind of more, I love my job, I really enjoy it, but I just want something to hedge against what's happening in the world. Right. And so if that's what your thing is, you can't go wrong with this. Amazon FBA was literally the best thing that anyone can do that's in that situation. Right. Simply because you're almost an entrepreneur. You're not, you are an entrepreneur, but you're not 100% responsible, right? Because Amazon is accounting, accounts for 83% of all online shopping that happens 
in the world, right? Secondly, they bring the traffic for you. I don't know. One was, I can't even remember last time I thought of buying something that actually went somewhere else aside from Amazon. So that's literally the perfect thing for you. The system is there. Logistics are there. Everything is there. You just got to tap into it, learn how to do it, and then go in there. Um, if you are in the, you're more of a, an entrepreneur, you want to start your own business, you're in the coaching niche, you want to do your own thing, or you've started to doing your own thing. If you're wondering that I'm responsible for all these people's businesses, then shut down your business and go work for someone else. Because a true entrepreneur should never ask that question, but instead should ask the question of how can I add more value to my customers more than ever, especially now in times of need, especially now in times of doubt. Because when then the rest of the world is in doubt and they're contracting, you can actually come to the top. And this is why I think I, I read something somewhere where 66% of the Fortune 500 companies were built in a recession or a depression. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I know people be hearing this and like, wait a minute, I can make money with Amazon? And so you have to kind of, okay, so what is FBA and then what is BJK University? Yeah, FBA first stands for fulfillment by Amazon. So that's very simple. And it is where you where you simply ship products to Amazon. They store them for you. As you create sales, Amazon fulfills orders for you. Up until 10 years ago, any, any system like that just did not exist. Amazon has made it super simple and streamlined for people like you, everyday people like me and you, to simply go in and start this business. You don't need a business background. You don't need a resume. The reason why I got into it was because... I had a felony on my record. I had lawsuits. I had just lost the business and had lost half a million dollars in the process. So my credit was shot. No one would give me a loan. No one would look at me. No one would hire me. I was just unhirable, right? And so when I started this business, they didn't look at my credit history. They didn't look at anything. They didn't look at how much money in the bank I had. They didn't look at anything, right? So anyone can start this over the age of 18, although we have some students that are like under 18, they just use mom's or dad's names to open an account. So you can still do that, but don't say that you heard it from me. Right. With that said, you simply find a product that already sells on Amazon. As I mentioned, 83% of all online shopping happens on Amazon. So there's literally millions, hundreds of millions of people that go to Amazon every single month, every single year to buy products. Products exist. So for example, this water, just water. You go, what we do is we do this thing called private label. Mm -hmm. We go to a manufacturer directly using websites like Alibaba. We find a manufacturer that creates this bottle, that white labels this bottle, and then we simply put our own brand on it, right? Just. So now I can create my own, literally my own product that looks exactly like this and compete with Just, right? Exactly like this. I just create, create different branding and I sell it to the same customers that Just is selling to on Amazon because literally everyone and their sister shops on Amazon. Gotcha. Okay. And how does that, how are you helping people with that in BJK University? So people are like, wait, I can make money. What kind of results are people getting from BJK University that you're like, oh, okay, this has really turned into something? Yeah. The way that BJK University started was, it was 2018 when I, when I had my Amazon business. The reason why I got into it was, again, I lost my restaurant, lost about half a million dollars in the process, was $150,000 in debt and, and lost the respect of my dad, which was the biggest thing for me. And so I wanted to retire my parents. I wanted to gain the respect back of my dad. And I wanted to, to retire, clear my debt. Again, it's all about me, right? All, all the reasons were about me. But I had a clear why, which is also important. You need to be clear on your why because that's the driver. I got into Amazon to settle all these things. Late 2018, once I had done all that, about three and a half years later, I realized that I've done all this, but I don't have a drive to wake up every morning. I probably was making, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month in profits. I was doing very well for the average person. And I had helped a couple of people throughout the process. A few people, a few friends that just were asking. I think one person I, you know, paid me like maybe a hundred bucks. Another friend was just like, I was doing it for free, just helping them out and stuff like that. And then one kid came out to me and said, over the last six months, you've helped me make, I think it was like 30 grand in profits or something like that. Wow. And this was a 23-year-old kid that lived in North Carolina. The, all he wanted to do was travel the country and get into, he used to do dirt biking. So he <laughs> wanted to get into tournaments 
and just not have to worry about making money and taking off from work and stuff like that. And now he had a business that ran from literally anywhere in the world that he could go and like and do his passion, focus on the thing that he really loved and enjoyed to do. And that truly moved me. It wasn't about wow. just the money that he made, but it's, it was about what the money allowed him to do. And I created a course. I started enrolling people into it. I started helping them out to create their own Amazon businesses. I used to charge $399. And literally, like, I used to give them everything. Phone calls, unlimited webinars. The price has increased a ton since then. But I just realized that people that pay attention and the more people pay more attention. But it's still way undervalued. When I tell people how much it is and what we offer, they look at me like I'm crazy. I've had people say that I can charge five to seven times more than what we charge for it right now. But it's essentially teaching people how to find a product on Amazon, launch it on Amazon, scale it on Amazon and be able to run this business from anywhere in the world with literally just a computer and internet. Now, I don't want to oversimplify it. And I don't want people thinking that this is something that I can do with, with maybe working 30 minutes a day. It's a business like any other business. You need to bust your ass. And the way that I started was working my face off. I was literally driving for Uber. I was working with my brother and I was running my Amazon business. I was working like 18 hours a day for about six months until I got my Amazon business off the ground. But it's important to understand is that right. if you're working a nine to five and you're sleeping another eight, there is another eight hours in a day that you could be spending building your dream job or your dream business. Right. And if you're not investing every single waking moment doing that, then this is not for you. For sure, 100%. So yeah, so you got one kid making 30,000. What's some other results that you've seen from people that are in BJK University getting coaching mentorship from you and your team? What are some of the heights that people have been able to get to? And for you, you're doing this with your, from your own business. Where are you able to get yours to? And then what level were you able to get your own personal business to? Yeah, so right now I have four accounts. Personally, they do a few hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue. I'm no longer an active seller. I am an investor in Amazon businesses because I wanted to build my coaching business. However, my coaching business has not evolved around me. Right now we have seven coaches. We actually just hired two. So we have seven coaches and four of which I am invested in their accounts and their businesses to grow them. And so we have seven coaches that are all six and seven figure Amazon sellers that work with our students directly to help them grow and to help them accomplish their dreams pretty much with Amazon. Mm -hmm. I mean, results, I mean, man, they vary. We have people that make $2,000 a month. We have people that make $20,000 a month. We have people that have made multiple seven figures. We've met people that made six, multiple six figures. The opportunity is there. The potential is there. It's all wow. about how much money or how much effort you're willing to put into it, how much time you're willing to put into it, what drives you, the tools are there. This is not brand new. We have over 5,700 students that have enrolled in our university over the last three years. Wow. And so it's up to you to determine how much you want because whatever you want is all available. The support is there. Everything is there. It's up to you and how much you want to get out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Bashar, thank you so much, man. This has definitely been amazing. It's opened my eyes to some other opportunities um, that I didn't even know about FBA and BJK, BJK University. So if there is a nine to fiver or an entrepreneur or pretending or trying to be an entrepreneur, where can they reach out to you to get more information on BJK University? Yeah, man, absolutely. So what we'll do is we'll actually put a link in the bio below for uh, for all of your audience to, to check out. There's a short case study that people can, you know, it kind of shows them more about what, what our university is about, what we do and how we help people. And then from there, they can get on a free one-on-one -on -one call with one of our enrollment coaches where they can ask all of their questions and see if this opportunity is for them. We don't force anyone into anything. If you want it, great. If you don't want it, there's literally hundreds and thousands of people lined up that are wanting to enroll in BJK University and that want to want us to help them. For um, sure. We'll, link, we'll put a link there for your audience to check out and go through the process and, and see if this is the right thing for them. For sure. Bashar, thank you so much. And again, that link is going to be BJK University forward slash Arturo dash Johnson. But yeah, Bashar, man, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. I'll be down in Miami to, to catch up. But thanks again for dropping some knowledge on the call, man. We'll see you next time. Thank you. All right, guys. So thank you again for tuning in to the Rainmaker podcast. So if you're a nine to fiver or an entrepreneur and you're looking to, to really become a recession proof, then reach out again. It's BJK University 
forward slash Arturo dash Johnson. Reach out to Bashar for help. He's been able to help over 5,000 people to start their own business and become recession proof. We'll see you in the next video.